a little bit of both. Okay. So um, let me start with the healthy bones and I can tell you what I've been doing. Well, the why, why, because I mean like um, strong, uh, strong bones, sorry, stronger bones is because we are so, we're always focused on muscles and building strength, which is great. Um, but the people, the population that we need to worry about with strengthening bones are our older clients, right? The older population, well, a lot of whom have some sort of bone, some bone loss even as they age. So whether that classifies as osteoporotic or osteopenia, that could be the case, but it could not even be the case. It's just that we don't create bone. We don't grow new bone as much as we age, or it takes longer for new bone to grow. So sometimes the rate of uh, the bones breakdown is greater than the rate of the bone regrowth. And then we end up with a situation like osteoporosis. So um, to how do we strengthen bones and why even think about it? Can we strengthen bones? I think that's the first question. And yes, we can ask the bones to regenerate themselves by certain behaviors and patterns and movement. And the one thing that we know uh, is what causes bones to want to regrow, well, two things, is loading, load, like weight load and vibration. So those are the two things that we know can strengthen bones. And the things that can hurt bone are loading in the, in the wrong direction. So in a direction that puts them at risk or uh, makes them vulnerable. So if we talk about the spine first, just to, to get an idea, if we talk about the spine, the spine actually, if you think about your vertebra stacked one on top of the other all the way up the chain, right? If you go, Pretend this is my belly side. I should just do it with my belly side so that you can see it. Right? So from this direction, my belly side and my back side, if I, I can feel my spines and my vertebra, if I go backwards, I actually put some load or pressure on the vertebra in a very healthy way. So when I go into extension, I'm actually loading the vertebra in a healthy way, in a way that asks bones to start creating more strength to support that extension. So extending the spine puts the load on towards the posterior side of the vertebra in a way that actually uh, enhances bone growth. So extension exercises are great for the spine to ask for bony growth. That kind of load is great. The load that's not great is the loaded flexion, which is anything uh, dangling down forward, seated forward, bend, and even upper ab curl loads and flexion, that loads the vertebra in a way that makes them vulnerable, not stronger. So mo most fracture, fractures can occur with rounding the spine forward. It makes the, the vertebra vulnerable, not loading. So it's not asking for any bone growth, it's just making, putting them in a place where they're not supported. So somebody with osteoporosis or osteopenia really should not be doing any loaded flexion or even upper ab curl, because when they do the bone density scan, they actually look at the lumbar spine and the rate of, because the rib cage is attached to the thoracic, but the rate of osteoporosis is usually higher in the thoracic spine than in the lumbar spine. The numbers are worse. So if you lift the head up, that loads that thoracic spine. So those are, that's sort of the contraindication for osteoporosis. But if we're just talking about strengthening bones in general, for the spine, extension is the way to really load and strengthen. For the rest of the body, it's putting load through those joints in a way that is good, healthy. So for example, you could uh, do work in standing, in good posture in standing. Um, and when you're in standing, bouncing, jumping, those activities really help, they start the vibration. So they really help vibrate and with that vibration, the bones tend to grow stronger. So um, I'll tell you in a minute what I've been doing in the classes, just to give you an idea. And then the, um, the hands, wrist would be taking load through the hands and wrists and arms to help strengthen through the hand, wrists and arms. And that could be weights, that could be TheraBand with some good resistance. It could be Pilates reformer work or springboard work or tower work. Um, it could be um, planks and handstands. It could be, so it could be anything that's putting weight through 
what to consider is the wrist, the wrist itself. So some the wrist here is at what we call the neutral position. If we go into extension, but it's a very extended position. So somebody who's not already strong, this could maybe not be the right position for them to start in. You maybe want to start in a uh, fisted knuckle so that your wrist is neutral position to load through there. So if we take that into account and we want to talk about it in terms of Pilates, what do we do for bone strengthening? And the question I always get is, does jumping on the reformer help increase bone strength? Is that enough load with the vibration? So jumping on the reformer has less vibration and less load, obviously, than jumping up, up and down on a floor. But um, I think, and there's, not a, there's no research I, that I know of that has been done on a jump board, on the Pilates jump board. So my guess, uh, my guess is that it's less effective than standing and jumping, for example, because it absorbs so much of the shock and it's not full body weight. But it could be a great training place. It's absolutely safe. And it could be a great way to train somebody to be able to jump in the upright position. So, and I'm sure it's creating some sort of load and vibration more than just a seated exercise, for example. So I think there is some value to it. I just don't know what that relationship is or the comparison is to standing. So, um, so in the class this week, I had the Tuesday and the Thursday class that I started them um, with just a warming up really on the mat the first day. And then we got our way up to standing and we did a lot of squatting. We did some bounces in standing just on toes, heels, just bouncing. We did um, some prancing in standing. We did squats. We did some lunges. Um, we did a lot of, we did some flanking. Um, and then we did some extension work prone. So baby swan, full swan, uh, scapular retraction and prone. Um, what else did I do on the first class? That was sort of the theme of it, right? Um, trying to think if there's any other extension work we did. I think that was about it. And we did the Pilates push-up. So the standing, hinging forward. I usually do a hinge forward rather than a forward bend. Hinge forward, walk your hands out, coming back, hinge back up. So, or bent knees in order to keep the spine neutral to get back up. Um, so we did those Pilates planks. And then this the class this morning, we did um, a, lot of, a lot more standing work. And I also brought in the uh, squatting all the way to the ground, sitting on the ground, getting up from the ground as part of the workout. And the reason for that is just because statistically, um, people who can get up and down off the ground without their hands have a much, much higher rates of longevity than people who cannot. It's a great predictor of longevity. So it's a great skill and a great task to do. So I had them all try to get up and down from the ground without using their hands um, in class. And we practiced the pieces of that, like lunging to the floor to one knee, um, coming from seated to lying down to back up, lunging back up from the ground without any hands. We did it with toes tucked under. We did it with um, foot under. So we did both, both postures of having the toes tucked under there and coming up. And then we did it with foot under coming up, just trying to work through that way so that people who have a reason not to bend the big toe could also come up. And, and then we did side planking, um, a lot more side planking too. This is my usually my more advanced class. And then we did, again, um, we did a lot of arm work, arm resistance work. Uh, using the TheraBand because that's what we can do virtually. Um, hugging trees, scooping, um, punching with, with good um, force, lunging front punch, but really just trying to punch uh, strongly. So creating also vibration with resistance. Um, and then we did more planking, um, planking, rolling snakes, um, where you open up into extension in the plank and roll back up, right? You guys, you guys know snake? Yeah. So snaking up and back. We did that from kneeling. We did that from full plank. And then we ended with um, arabesque uh, plank. Pilates push-up arabesque, if they could. That was their sort of... Oh, and we did a little bit of standing balance work. Um, so that was the other thing I talked to them a lot about is that one of the best ways to prevent fractures as we age is to prevent falls. 
And the things that prevent falls are balance and good posture. So we worked on, and that was what we did on Tuesday. We started on the foam roller, working on posture and then worked our way up. And then this class today, we worked on standing, balancing on one leg, opening the leg out, and then eventually coming into like a stance on one leg, holding the foot, foot out in front to make it really nice and challenging, working on getting that posture up. So that's sort of what I did with the bone, healthy bones, strength in your bones option or class week theme. Does anybody have any questions, need to see anything, any ideas? I just have a quick question about the vibration. Could you just mm -hmm. explain a little bit more about what you mean by how vibration helps build healthier bones? For, I understand the weight yeah. bearing really well and that's like very um, you know, common, but I haven't heard much about vibration. Yeah, so the research is showing that if you um, have, for example, if you go for a walk in really soft tennis shoes, you have a lot of shock absorption potential. And especially if you walk on dirt with a soft tennis shoe, just to give us up even more, um, there's not a lot of um, pound or a lot of pressure, as much pressure as if you would walk on a hard sidewalk in a clog with a wooden sole, right? Then you're gonna get um, a lot more pressure, like a hit uh, or a jump or something like that. When that happens on a hard surface, there's this vibration sense that sends up through the chain through your body. And with that vibration, it, it activates, uh, and I'd have to look up exactly what the mechanism is, but it activates the receptors in the bone and the bone knows that I have to be able to resist that force and that impact. And so over time, having to resist, our bodies do this, you do this with your muscles, you do this with your bones. The more pressure, the more we get stronger to sustain the pressure. When we get injured, we've overdone it. We've gone too far. Right, with, whether it's muscle or bone, right? With a broken arm, it's pretty apparent, right? It just was too much pressure for those bones and they broke. With a muscle tear, it's the same thing. It was too much for the muscle to sustain and the muscle fibers tore. But if we, with a muscle, if we, when we strengthen the muscle, we tear fibers a little bit, just a little bit. And that process asks the body to build up strength to sustain us the next time. And that's actually how our muscles get bigger. It's the same with bones, right? If we ask for more um, out of the bones over time, the bones say, oh, I need to be stronger because I need to be able to sustain that force or that vibration or that impact. So um, that's the non-scientific explanation, but that, that's sort of how that goes through um, how, why your body does that. So for somebody with low bone density, they really should be walking on harder surfaces with not so squishy shoes if possible. But the problem with that scenario or jumping that way to jumping barefoot would be great. Like what we do in Pilates, right? But with that, the problem with that scenario is joint, right? So the absorption helps the joints. So somebody with problems with their joints is not gonna appreciate not squishy, barefoot walking on cement or <laughs> jumping without shoes, right? So there's a, there's a little bit of that balance that has to happen. Yes. Yeah. Thank Does you. Does that help? Yeah. Absolutely. And the research, makes sense. there's a lot of research with that. And there's also research with people swimming and, and um, doing aerobics in the pool versus doing aerobics on the ground. And the people doing the aerobics in the pool actually did not, some of them lost, I don't know if it was the people, I have to look up the article again, but I'm not sure if it was the people doing the aerobics who lost bone density or people who were just swimming who actually lost bone density. And the people who are on the ground gained it because there's no um, pressure, there's no vibration, there's no load, right, in the pool or no, but you know, minimum. So, so yeah, That's interesting. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing to study, actually, um, the bone densities and the bone. But I mean, even for the average, I think um, I, I don't know about what your client loads are like. Our clients tend to be um, those active adults and older adults. So 60 and up, we have a lot 
um, who are really active and healthy, but they need to do things to keep them that way. So at this point, um, just giving them these exercises, they're not osteoporosis for, you know, then maybe even not that, but getting good strong bones is, is always helpful. So I'm, I think we I'm probably sure work with similar that, clients. Yeah. What's that? Oh, I was, I was going to say, I, um, I, I was wondering about like, like physical, like making vibrations, like with your, on your own body. So it's not the joints necessarily. Is that something that, is there any evidence in that or any research on that? Or is that just a, you, know, you see you know, people with like padding and like the, you know, wake up the body kind of thing. And I wonder if there's yeah. anything. I'm not sure. I would have to go look it up and see. Uh, I know that you remember, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, they had these vibrating plates and they said, they're gonna make you lose weight. Do you remember those? You'd stand on this plate and do nothing and you'd lose weight supposedly. Well, what they found out is it, those actually didn't work for losing weight, but what they did do was strengthen bone. So it's a really interesting, so vibration um, standing on this moving platform, that vibration was stimulating bone growth, but it wasn't stimulating weight loss. I don't know why they ever thought that in the first place. So could vibration, um, patting yourself or doing self vi vibration help? Is it possible? Maybe. Uh, I don't, I don't know. And um, so maybe we could look it up. I, I can see if I can find anything interesting on that. Um, see if there's anything out there about um, bones and vibration. And I'll let you know, I can send a little message. Yeah. yeah. Did you guys um, already talk about I was I lost reception for a second. And since you guys are talking about vibrations, um, and I don't even know if this would fit but, um, you know, tell me if you think, um, you know, like the, the tens machine and how it like vibrates the nerves, like, could that play into any sort of positive vibrations? I have not heard that at all. I have not heard it. We, I've used tens units, but never for that purpose. Um, I think it's attacking, the thing about a tens unit is that it's basically blocking your pain receptors. So that signal that it's sending is um, just blocking those pain receptors in a TENS unit. It's confusing the sodium calcium channels is what it's doing. Um, so it's a totally different mechanism. I'm not sure that it's actually vibrating except for kind of tickling under there, or maybe vibrating just at the skin level, but not enough to vibrate the body and the bones. Okay, I was so, just, I was just curious. I was just thinking, yeah, of, like, you know, stuff that we use in physical therapy or Pilates, and I was like, huh. So, um, yeah, that's yeah. Good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, good. Any other comments, questions on the bones? Okay, well, let's go to talking about healthy hamstrings. So healthy hamstrings, why a whole week on healthy hamstrings? Um, I'm adamant about trying to keep my own hamstrings healthy so that I can keep running because I like to run. <laughs> and um, I personally have uh, fought with my hamstrings a lot over the years. Um, and so maybe I'm a little bit more personally invested in healthy hamstrings. And what I've Notice I had a hamstring tear in my 20s um, when I was performing a lot and we were doing three shows a day and um, it was during one, it was like a two week run of three shows a day and I was warming up for a show and I just felt, I was in this little over split and I felt my hamstring go and, and it was a year worth of work to get it to be not painful anymore. And so, and then I got it better and it was fine. And then what I noticed is in, now I'm in my forties. Um, if I do the wrong, I, I went through this phase of thinking I'm a hypermobile person. I need to tighten up, not loosen up. So maybe I don't need to stretch as much my hamstrings thinking maybe that would create more stability at my side joint. Maybe that would help. So I went through this phase of that. 
Um, it totally backfired. That's a bad idea. <laughs> Don't ever think you should be an uh, athlete, runner, cyclist, whatever, and not stretch to the point where you're feeling stretched um, because you need to have that stretch and length. You need to maintain the length you have. I, I probably don't need to get more length. I just needed to maintain the stretch for the length I had. And so that sent me down a pathway of a series of hamstring and glute medius tearing that I fought with um, for a long time. And I couldn't figure out what I was missing because I was, I went back to, I was strengthening the whole time. I went back to stretching um, and couldn't quite get it right. I, so I think I probably, between the two hamstrings had a series of probably four tears um, back and forth in the, in the upper hamstrings and into the glute. And um, now, knock on wood, they're super healthy and I'm hoping that I can, I'm doing it right this time, the right amount of stretch, the right amount of strength and strength work. Um, and so, I, but then I have probably seen in the past year, well, not the COVID year, the year before, I've probably seen maybe five or six women in their mid 40s to mid 50s or early right to 60 with similar things, hamstring tearing, glute medius tearing, mostly women, it happens to men, but mostly women, um, all active runners, cyclists, um, some like trekkers, uh, so there were some, one was walking, doing like a 50 mile walk to raise money, I think for breast cancer it was. So, you know, just they're, they're beyond sort of just going for a two mile walk every day people for sure. But how do we keep the hamstrings healthy? Uh, as I mean, I tore mine in my twenties, so it can happen then. But I think, especially in that timeline of life to how do you keep those hamstrings healthy? And what is it that we could be missing? Um, I was doing strength work. I was back to stretching um, and I was still tearing. Um, so um, I, what I think is tends to miss is that we create strength. And well, first of all, I think it's really hard to create a balance between quads and hamstrings. Quads do a lot of work. Um, and I would say mid-range quad work. End range quad work, I think is lacking too. I'll mention that and maybe we can have a discussion just about end range quad work one time. But uh, mid range quad work does a lot of the work for us if we're gonna do squats, if we're gonna go run, if we're gonna go hike up a hill, if we're gonna dance or if we're gonna jump or right. So all quads do a lot of work. And I think it's really hard to keep the balance between quad and hamstring going the whole time. So I think for a lot of people, quads take over. And maybe glutes do some of the work that hamstrings should be doing. And then the, the other, so getting the hamstrings to be as strong to be equivalent to what the quad hold is hard already. And then the other piece of that is that the hamstring, as it finishes up into the buttock, right? If you guys all remember, they come all the way up into the P, uh, PSIS, not PSIS, the ischial tuberosity right? The hamstrings all insert there together. That top part of the hamstring, if we were to look at it on uh, an anatomically speaking, those big muscles are big, juicy muscles, right? Hamstrings, they come into these tiny fibers, tendons, and attach to that one spot. So their uh, insertion point up there or their attachment point up there is very narrow compared to the width and size of the hamstrings. And most people tear up there towards the buttock, right? Right into that um, ischial tuberosity at the top. I would say the top piece of the hamstrings, whether no matter which one of the muscles tears, most often, I think I've had one person tear their hamstring mid, mid upper thigh. Um, the rest have been right up there, right? Maybe within, you know, two, two and a half inches of the ischial tuberosity or right at the ischial tuberosity. So what is it that, that allows us to strengthen that area? And so I went on a journey for myself as much as my clients to try and figure out when is that actually working the most at that part of the hamstring? Where is the most stress? What is it that I'm missing? If I'm doing bridging all day long and I'm 
doing squats and I'm laying on my belly, I've got my knees bent and I'm pressing, you know, those glute squeezes we do, prone glute hip squeezes and presses upward with bent knees. Those are great hamstring, butt hamstring work. All the prone work, lifting legs is all great work. I was doing arabesque work with resistance, all of that, but there was something still missing and it was actually getting work way up there near the buttock for the hamstring. So the things that actually help strengthen that part are deadlifts or, and um, I find it actually most effective in the TRX, uh, going up into a bridge and extending the legs all the way straight and bringing them back in. So getting that last bit of hamstring on stretch and having to work it back, back in from there. So we don't do deadlifts in Pilates. I don't, I don't actually like deadlifts at all, but we do do our plank, our push-up. The Pilates push-up is from standing, hinge down, walk out, come back up, right? That is exactly the, the place we need to work, that top of that hamstring, that control. So that's one of the reasons why I like the hinge back version of that rather than just rolling down into it. Because that hinge version puts the top of the hamstring on stretch and then asks you to come back to strength, to, to use it to come back upward, right? So that's, that coming back up action is actually the concentric hamstring. This lowering down is that eccentric hamstring, right? So both very valuable when, when done with good control. So, um, Dana, just question. Really quick, um, I just want to make sure that I'm following you. Are you, you're talking about, um, like kind of going into like downward dog into plank. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So coming from, I think it's going to cut off my head. Let me move back just a second. Okay, so we can go from here. So where I want to feel that activation is where most people commonly tear, which I find is up in this area, right? Right up near the um, ischial tuberosity. So if I go hinge here, right, that puts the work up here more. Um, and then working to come back up from here, that's where I'm getting that concentric contraction back here. So the shortening contraction of that muscle. Here is the lengthening control. Here is the shortening control. Right, so this is a great way to work on strengthening those hamstrings. So in the Pilates repertoire, we have, for Matt, we have the, you know, coming down. If you can maintain that flat back, and then you could, you could take it all the way out into the plank, right? and then hold that plank. Um, and then you could work the way back up, coming back to that flat back and hinging the way up. That's a lot of work in the hamstring there, right? Deadlifts, we know work, that, that's what deadlifts do too, right? People, they're coming down, hinging here, coming to here, and then coming up with their weight, right? It's that same action, working the back of the hamstring. The other place that we have this in the Pilates repertoire is we use the springboard. You could use the tower also is the um, arabesque, right? The, with the springboard bar, holding onto that, doing the leg stand, leg up, keeping that straight line, pulling down and up and down and up. That's my stance leg hamstring doing that same work on single leg. So this is a really nice way to do, um, to get that same work happening in the hamstring. And then the other way that I find is really good, um, and so you could use roller, you could use gym ball, you could use TRX, is actually my favorite. I get it most, more work with TRX here, and the legs are a little higher than they would be on the roller. So I, I think that position helps. But here, if I um, lay down, sorry, no, no, screen higher, but I think you can still see me. So here I could hinge my way up and work the way out with the roller until I get to that 
straight leg out and then I can pull it back in, right? But if I go part way, I don't get it. I do, I'm working here, but not as much as if I have to work from this last bit out and bring that last bit in. It's that last bit of it that I feel coming right up into the buttock there. So for strength work, if it's somebody with, yeah, the other way, the other place we have that is the um, bottom lift on the reformer, right? Getting the legs out to full extension. So I've, and I've had discussions with people who are trained to teach bottom lift on reformer with only partial movement out and in. Um, but I really actually think there's value to getting the legs extended for somebody who can do it. Some people I think can't do it because it goes to their lower back. But if you can do it without it going to the lower back, I think that's a great place also to, to work that. And even working that last bit a little bit, just maybe going out and in that last little bit could be really helpful too. So for strengthening, those are the things I would say that we sometimes miss in the Pilates repertoire. They, they're there. There are places where it is there, but we don't always go there. When you think about strength, hamstrings, we don't always think about we need that last little bit right, of, of that extension. So it gets right up into the buttock area. Um, so that, that's one thing. On the stretching side of things, uh, the problem, so if we talk about, there's two categories of people. There are people who are just tight and need to stretch their hamstrings and they just never have, or they just need to get more length in their hamstrings since they've never had the appropriate amount of length. And then some of the sports they're doing require length. So for running, you need long, long, more length in the hamstring than you do for walking. For jumping, you need more length. For cartwheeling, you need more length. You know? So you wanna think about what activities they might be doing and what length they need. And they need to be stretching to a point beyond, not extremely beyond, but a little bit beyond what they actually need to use and function in order to protect those muscles, right? That's true for any muscle. You can't just stretch to the point of where it needs to be worked. You have to have more length, a little bit more length than what you actually want to use when you're active and moving. So those hamstrings have to be long enough and then a little bit to do their sport safely or their activity safely. And the other big mistake is not warming up enough. So cold body, right? It's, the muscles are going to be shorter when they're cold. And then there could be, a, a, if there's a ballistic motion, like a takeoff, that's where we tear hamstrings a lot and calf muscles a lot tear when, yes, Genevieve knows that one. Yeah, it, um, you know, going out on a freezing cold night and then dancing in the street right away and doing some crazy split, like that's a bad idea. <laughs> we know that's how Genevieve hurt herself, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, having it warming up enough appropriately and then stretching after activity is usually the best, but stretching enough before the activity so that you're not, so you're warm and stretch out ready for it um, will help prevent those injuries as well. So that would be sort of your tight person needs, those are the things that tight person needs, good stretching, normal ranges, range of motion enough, plus just a bit to do their activity. We have this other side of people that we see a lot in Pilates, I think, um, are the hypermobile category. And I think the hypermobile category is a lot more tricky in this case. It's tricky already to know um, how much stretching is necessary. And this is my opinion. It's not, I don't have research that shows it, but my opinion and from my experience has been that a mistake that we, even medical practitioners make is that there is a, um, we, when you study about muscles and lengths, you study that between so many degrees is the right amount of motion for a hip joint or for a hamstring or for a quad. Like that's the acceptable, there's an acceptable range of motion. So a lot of times, if you look at somebody who's hypermobile and they get into that, they'll just get into that range of motion even when they feel tight because they're, not tight in that regular range of motion. So if, if some medical practitioner is going down their checklist, they check out, oh, you've got enough range of motion, you're good. But it's not necessarily, in my opinion, the right amount of range of motion based on what it should be because of the hypermobility in that person. So um, 
I, and I think you need to stretch to the point of stretching the muscles out, not to the point of what seems to be the right range of motion. So that in my head was my self case study experiment that I did. For me, I could stretch my hamstring within that normal range. It didn't really feel like much of a stretch to me thinking maybe I'll tighten up a little and maybe that'll actually be good. Not good because then what happens is I guarded around that not stretched area. So if you think of the anatomy between hamstrings coming into the ischial tuberosity, and then you have your SI joint there, right? So it's pelvis, the ilia, with ischium, ilia, and SI joint, right? And so that SI joint on somebody who's hypermobile is easily moved as well. And now if you think about a tight hamstring, and inevitably, if you're not stretching enough, one side is going to be unbalanced from the other. If we follow our normal body patterns, right, we need to be balancing ourselves out. And so if anything pulls, or if I took a misstep with one side, I could pull that whole sacrum out of joint two. So the stretching has to happen evenly on both sides. But then I ended up with this challenge of if I got tight in those hamstrings and I went to stretch them, instead of stretching the hamstring, I'd end up pulling a side joint out of so it was this sort of battle between how much do you stretch and um, how much stability do I do you need? So the same rules apply as for our stiff people, except in a different range of motion. So I wouldn't be fixed to numbers. I'd be fixed to where is that stretch? What is the normal for this particular person? They need to be able to stretch in that normal, but even more so, they have to be stronger for stability to stretch off of something. If I end up trying to stretch uh, a tight muscle and my joints are loose, I'm just gonna move joint. I'm not gonna end up stretching muscle. So it's imperative that the hypermobile population really fix themselves in a static position and really isolate the stretch more than it is for the stiff people because they won't ever get that far, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm sure you have questions about that. <laughs> I hope. Yes, go for it. I have so many questions. <laughs> um, so I, I also have a hamstring issue. I tore my hamstring doing a cartwheel when I was cold in the middle of the street, of course, <laughs> at night. Um, and that was about eight years ago. And unfortunately, at that time, I was not as aware as I am now and just followed my physical therapist's um, recommendation to rest. And so now that I well, I, I was in so much pain, I didn't really move much and I had to stop doing Pilates. What I found was that um, as my hamstrings seemed to get better, um, it felt like my psoas would tighten so much I could barely use like the right side. I couldn't do even like oblique work on that side. Um, so I have like my own personal experience with it. And then I've worked with many clients um, and I'm a runner and a hiker and a cyclist. So I also like the quad dominant thing really resonated. And I tend to attract clients who are pretty active as well. So I see a lot of hamstring stuff. And I remember being in so much pain that I felt like I couldn't do anything, being told by Kaiser Physical Therapy not to do anything. And then a year out, still being in pain and feeling like, oh my God, I think all the scar tissue has just made me stick this way and I'm going to be in pain forever. And now I don't know how to stretch it. So this is a long-winded way of asking a, <laughs> multiple questions, which are, when you're working with other people and you can't feel their experience, how do you help guide them? And especially in the online format, how do you help guide them, whether it's group classes or privates to safely work through some of that pain from like scar tissue building up and that holding pattern happening without them exacerbating mm -hmm. an issue. And then in often cases when people feel any type of discomfort, they just wanna stop doing it altogether and they give up. I don't want that to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you can't know exactly. I think it's almost easier when it's yourself. I, I felt like it was, it's sometimes easier when I tear my own hamstring to know what to do than it is when it's somebody else's hamstring because I can't feel what stage they're in in the healing process. So it's it really comes down to form a little more formulaic and then adding it into what their experience is and what their descriptive terms are. So being a really good listener and then also just being aware of sort of the timeline. 
So timeline, if we go to like sort of basic timeline for body, body healing time is six to eight weeks for tissues to heal. It just takes six to eight weeks. So that if you came to me in the first four weeks of this, or even three weeks sometimes, or even one week or two weeks after this tear happened, I would say, you've got to rest. Stop stretching. Don't try to stretch it. It needs to knit at that point. So if you imagine it is, I'm going to give you the most simple <laughs> diagram, right? My hands, they're knitted. These are the muscle fibers. They're all knitted together, right? If we go like this and they come apart from each other, we need time for those fibers to knit or scar or both back together because we need them to be attached for healing to take place. So we need a way either of scarring or them they're actually pulling. If we keep stretching, we keep pulling them back apart. We don't allow that healing time. So, but that timeline is in my head, what I say to myself is, okay, four weeks from time of injury, we're really not doing much of anything except for things that might shorten the hamstring. So if you think about shortening activities, those would be what, like laying on your tummy, bending your heel towards your bottom. Um, and we also, we, but we wanna do things that are, or maybe sitting on a chair, pulling your heel underneath you without resistance. Things that shorten without resistance. But then again, sitting, right, puts that hamstring a bit on stretch under the glue. And a lot of people have that pain with sitting, a lot of pain with sitting. What we also don't want to promote is inflammation at the initial time of injury because inflammation, if it gets chronic, also slows down that healing process. So those four, first four weeks, we might be doing a few little things to just work around. We strengthen the rest of the body, but nothing that causes pain. And we don't want to be stretching at all for the first four weeks, maybe for the first six weeks, depending on how severe the tear actually was, bruising, was there bruising involved? Was there, um, what do you, what is, what was the mechanism? Was it that they just bent down and it tore or was it like they jumped or cartwheeled? Do you know what was the mechanism? Because that will make a difference too. Um, and then waiting that six weeks before really trying to do any stretching at all, or maybe the eight weeks, depending on age and severity. So the older they are, the longer to heal. Um, severity, the worse it is, the longer to heal. And then I would start, what I tell them usually is to do a supine hamstring stretch with mild to moderate intensity, but hold it for three minutes, keeping it mild to moderate the whole time. And they shouldn't feel any sharpness at all, but just allow them to gradually pull into more stretch over those three minutes. And when they get up, if they feel sore, a little sore, they should get up and not feel sore at all. If they're feeling sore after getting up, this is the initial stretches, then it's too much. Because now we don't want the muscles to heal in a ball like this, which is what, you know, that scarring it can do, right? It can it will keep pulling and will ball up. We want them to heal in their length so that then we have back sort of a normal range of motion after. So that would be what you start at six or eight weeks. And then you have to work progressively from there. And it has to be gentle, moderate stretching for long hold times, long hold times, three minutes at a time sitting in those stretches. I tell people sometimes, get your foot up on a wall, get your butt down, pick, pull out a book, listen to a podcast, hang out, and you're stretching for 15, 20 minutes, switching from side to side, just all nothing more than moderate stretching. Now, if you came to me a year out and said, I still have pain, I'd say to you, let's get to work. Let's break up that scar tissue. Let's get you some length back. Let's maybe even um, have somebody work on it manually and really get those fibers lengthening and um, stretching so that you're back at your range. Now, a year out, and if that hurts you at a year out, I don't care anymore, <laughs> right? Because what's, what now has happened is you're balled up too much. And now we need to break that scarring apart and get you out and breaking scarring hurts. And so if you wait too long to get to the stretch, then you're gonna have pain because of the scar. If, if you wait too short a time, you're gonna re-injure it. Mm -hmm. And it's a super vulnerable time. Uh, so like run, I, because I don't ever wanna stop being active, I always prolong the healing process by 
still running and, and inevitably I'll trip over a rock and have to step fast and then I tear more fibers. I'm like, I'll come back again another month, you know, like, but I'm doing it to myself. So the safe way would be to do exercises that don't put you at risk for re-injury um, while it's in that healing process. So the first four months, really, it really takes a long time for those fibers. And then you could add a lot of strengthening at that point. So the strengthening comes first, then the stretching comes second to the strengthening. And you just progressively strengthen more and more. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, it does help. I, th I think also a lot of the questions I have around the hamstrings specifically, because so many people have tight hamstrings, um, is related to how to, like, everything you said makes sense to me, absolutely. And also the different stages of healing, how we would address that differently. I think um, a remaining question is just how to help people, like how to cue people so that, for example, like hypermobility in the SI joint, I'll often you know, talk about like lengthening through the spine and grounding down through the sacrum and not allowing, like if we're stretching the right hamstring, not allowing the right hip to hike up, um, staying long to the side body. I'm just wondering if anyone has any other cues that they might use to help people get into specifically higher up in the hamstring or specific mm -hmm. stretches that they might find that people are more able to get into the stretch yeah. than others. Especially with Let these like, online you. classes where you can't do any tactile yeah. healing. Yeah, so here's what I've come to as my favorite one to really get the different range of hamstring. Um, and I use a lot of tools. So TheraBand and Roller, actually. Um, and then you can go hips on Roller, right? This leg, it's up to you. Could be up. Uh, could be bent like this. That would be more quad stretchy. This would be more psoas stretchy. The, if the, the psoas is going stretchy, it's going to take, um, you're going to have less hamstring length. So you could do whatever you want, whatever you feel is most appropriate with this bottom leg. With the top leg, what I found really helps is taking the TheraBand. And instead of coming into a sort of a more classic hamstring stretch that way, with the straight leg the whole way, I find that bringing it in, bend, and then working, instead of working to go upward, which you could, you could bend and straighten going upward with some resistance, or you could just have the band there to hold some of the weight of the leg. Um, I find that taking the leg over, so me staying put, leg going over gets right into that lower, um, area right in the lower hamstring in this position i have the tactile cueing of the roller so i'm not lifting my butt off the roller i'm keeping it on the roller on both sides evenly as i do so it kind of gives me one less thing to worry about and then i i will just go with where i can get to and sometimes that little pumping into the motion seems to help a lot so you could do it this way you could pump up that way, you know, depending on the mobility of the person you're working with. But this is, a, I find a really great way to work on opening the top right up in that buttock area of the hamstring. It's my favorite. So I don't know that if That is any, so helpful. Else. Yeah. Yeah, especially with any, the foam roller. Yeah, the foam roller just grounds. You could use a, you could use a block, you could use, um, a wedge too, something mm -hmm. that gives the feedback. So the sacrum is there and then they don't have, you don't have to worry about the sacrum curling up because it's getting the feedback and you're on both sides and then bringing the thigh in, they have that feedback to keep the, the sacrum still and supported. Yeah. So it just takes, takes uh, less, it's, they can feel it more, especially since you can't be there to stick your hand in their <laughs> hip, hold that, you know, Hold that side down as they go into a hamstring stretch. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I've been doing the, um, what you were saying, like the second one where you're pumping up towards the ceiling. But I had kind of forgotten actually about drawing the leg kind of overhead, like over your overhead. face reaching behind you. And that I can feel it actually as you were saying it. I was like, oh yeah, I need to do more of that myself in addition to helping my clients with yeah. that. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I mean, and I think the hamstrings are something that you can't overwork uh, in terms of 
over pay attention to overwork, right? They can always use more love. Um, I find that that we always need to, I, much like um, I think triceps, we need to focus on a little bit more than biceps. I think hamstrings need to be focused on a little bit more than quads. Quads just get more work and biceps get more work in our daily functioning because they're in front of our body and we tend to have a lot of a front, front body work more than back body work. So I think um, adding, we, I always do bridging in my classes just because I feel like it's necessary and sometimes I feel like it's still not enough. But um, yeah, so I try to stay much more focused on the back side than the front side typically um, to give them something. But I think where we, where we go wrong with hamstrings is not having enough of those hinging motions not going all the way out with the legs in a levitated bridge um, and then not getting uh, the right amount of stretch. Um, or like you said, the sacrum comes up or the uneven stretch and then we're just twisting and um, moving sacrum around. And I find it's the hypermobile people who actually can't stabilize as well. So they think that they're so flexy and cool <laughs> and they just want to go to end range, but they don't know how to get there properly. And they think they're getting there properly. It's so hard to control them. So giving them feedback like this and putting them in a position that's less familiar to them actually, I think really helps so that they're just following cues rather than thinking I need to be here or here um, for that. So. Yeah, any other thoughts on those? I was thinking about um, reverse plank. That kind mm -hmm. of, I feel like gets a little bit up at that top hamstring yes. range also. Yes, and so this this way, yes. Yeah. So control back, that's right. I didn't mention control back. Control back is really great. Um, it is super challenging on those hamstrings, right? When we go to single leg here is okay. But that up, like it's both hamstrings. It's the one down and the one up that are getting work as you go up and back down there, right? So that is actually a great one. Thank you. Yeah, that, and that's hard. That's really hard. Don't do that with some who's still torn, only when they're healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and you. Also, sorry, I, um, I lost connection for a second when we were talking about the beginning stages of healing the hamstring. Were you saying, concentric motion unweighted basically to start? Yeah, yeah. so um, yeah, we, the ones that I would start in that early phase would be really prone knee bending and maybe even pr little presses up. Things where you're a little more focused on the glutes than the mm -hmm. hamstring, the hamstring kicks in and prone too. So even if I go um, prone here, and um, even if I just took my toes under and lift my knees up, my kneecaps up, I'm getting some work up here. So this could be a, a baby start to activation. And then you could do it floating legs up. And then you could start. So as I get into, well, Charlie Chaplin's work quite a lot, right? the glute and the top of the hamstring. And then I could get to here, working, pressing upward. If I can do this, this is activating hamstring, um, the whole hamstring, but I do get it right up here and glute. So sometimes those are some of the first ones that I'll do because they're not loaded. They're not really weighted. Um, the chance of something going wrong for the ham, are you making the hamstring worse in those positions is next to nothing. I can't, I don't think I've ever, if the person can't, is so painful that they can't even get their leg all the way straight, then they can work a little bit in bent even and just keep it, you could, you could put something under their feet and have them not go all the way straight and just work to try and get straight, try and get the knees up. But that could be very baby first if it's a really bad one. Um, and then we talked about going to seated, right? Seated, but seated, the problem with seated is that as soon as you are in that, that much, Right, seated, I'm in hip flexion. So I'm already putting stretch on the hamstring. And then we put load right there at the top of the, at the ischial tuberosity where they all come in and attach. And sometimes that's super uncomfortable to sit on. So it may, but seated little hamstring curls, if they could, would be good. 
if they can, if they're at that stage, if they can't sit on their butt, then you would do it. You would do it else another way, prone. You could even work kneeling. I worked, uh, I work a lot also with um, kneeling in this position, just trying to get them forward and then just holding and doing arm work here with resistance sometimes just to get that work happening. But that could be another first stage type of activity exercise. And then obviously going to quadruped after that with the leg extensions, right? Those are also hamstring glute, the, all these, right? And straight legs and the up downs. Those are also just another phase moving up. So really, those are all really safe uh, kind of first stage exercises. The ones that are a lot harder, like the control back is sort of um, the, or reverse plank or control back, is probably the hardest one of all of those. I think that puts the most strain on. And maybe feet in TRX, straight legs going out would be the second hardest, I think, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anything else, Allegra, any questions or thoughts? Um, I, I had a question question it's kind of related to hamstrings it's um but it's kind of related to the the quadruped and it's kind of related to um sorry it's kind of related to um like uh so, yeah just all those things i said so i was working with my client this morning and um so when she went into child's pose when she went into quadruped um, you know, cause I was just, we were just stretching. Like she said, she, if she felt it in her sciatica and then I was just thinking about, well, um, okay, maybe in prone, but I just told her to lie on her back and like sort of bring her knees gently to her chest to try to stretch, you know, the back and, you know, maybe the hamstrings a little bit because when she was on her back, she was fine. But then she, when she went like more into a prone or a quadruped, it was, it was irritating her. So you know, I was just trying to get some, I mean, mainly the focus was, um, like the lower back, but, you know, she was feeling it in that kind of top of the hamstringy area. So, um, I don't know, maybe if that's a question that I need to email you about, like, that's fine. I don't, maybe it doesn't like to mm -hmm. my hair. So you let me know. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting idea though. And it is worth mentioning because we know that a lot of the back stuff refers or gets the nerve, if the nerve is getting pressure from the back and then it runs through the glute buttock, a lot of times that pain is that line, right? It's across the piriformis, if you imagine the piriformis, right? So the pain or the problem area could be here, but the pain is the coming down through here, right? And then right in through that hamstring and then down the back of the leg. And what you see as a symptom is super tightness in the hamstring. So, but that's a neurological or nerve impingement tightness, not a muscle tightness. So when the pressure comes off the nerve, then there will be no more hamstring tightness. Gotcha. Right? It's an interesting thing. Um, so it, it is worth mention and it's worth thinking about because what do we do about stretching hamstrings that are being affected by nerve? Um, and so, in that case, Allegra, it sounds like the reason she was having pain in prone was because of something positionally for her back was aggravating her in prone in that particular case. Because typically, if I put somebody prone, it's shortening the hamstring, not lengthening it. And if I bring somebody's knees to chest, it's lengthening the hamstring, not shortening it. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? So if it was a hamstring tear, she would feel work, it would be the opposite. Her symptoms would have been opposite of what they were. So uh, by your description and by, I'm pretty clear in my head that a hamstring tear is not the issue. It's coming from the back because of her relief position and her pain position. Yeah, yeah. But, but we do need to stretch hamstrings for people with that kind of nerve impingement because we wanna try not to have more pressure up in the hamstring glute area. We want to have less if we can. So trying to keep that hamstring long and keeping the nerve gliding is also a great idea. So being able to hamstring stretch there. 
um, is a good idea, but if they're too acute and you go into hamstring stretching, you'll just put more pressure on the nerve and they'll feel worse after. Yeah. So it's not a, no, no, the muscular rules don't apply in that case. Gotcha. It's a different rule set. Mm -hmm. All right. It just, yeah. you know, right, right at the moment, I just, I got like a little, just like, um, just, I don't know, I guess I, there was just like, I just lost like my focus for a second. So, but now mm -hmm. that totally makes sense. Um, you know, I think that yeah. it's, you know, just trying to guide her back to a good, good place. So sounds good. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, lots to think about. Yeah. So, no, um, great. Yeah. And then next week I have something going on about the tummy. I forget what it is. Now I'll have to look it up and <laughs> remind you when I say we'll post it. Um, and then if you need, Naya, if you need to get access and you can't be here, just email us and um, we can get you access to the video. I'll ask Tiziana what the plan is, but the plan was we were talking about putting them on a YouTube channel and I'll get you that information. Um, if I can, if you just make sure I have your email, I think we do, right? Have yeah, email. that's how I got this link today. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'll just make sure that we stay in touch. And then as much as you can, even if you can only be here for part of the time, uh, that's great. Just pop in and out as you can. People do pop in and out all the time. Um, so even if you took leave early or whatever, it's no problem. So thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Dana. All right. You're welcome, ladies. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Good to see you all, and I'll uh, have a great rest of the week. I'll see you next week. <laughs> I'm good. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, you guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs>